Well, hello, Lavington Vineyard Church. All those who are here with me in person, Keribuni Sana. It is so great to have you guys here. Welcome to all of those watching through the video on the screen. This is such a treat for me after a year to be preaching to people in person. So I'm going to do my best, just like Lily and Ben the last couple weeks, do my best to, to make eye contact with you guys, but also to the camera. So it is such a treat to have you guys here. It's been so long. A few years back, my oldest son and I had a chance to go on a trip, a camping trip with some other guys to Mount Suswa. And as part of that trip, we decided we wanted to take a, a, a hike inside the caves, inside Mount Suswa. And so as our Maasai guide took us in to these caves, I don't even know how many kilometers we went inside, but you're, you're quickly enveloped in this darkness. Of course, everyone has either a headlamp on or some kind of torch or flashlight. So you go in and at some point he tells you, okay, on the count of three, everyone turn off your light. And when we did that, it was unbelievable. I have never been in that kind of darkness in my entire life. I've been out in the middle of nowhere where, you know, when there's no moon, there's no light pollution, um, there's clouds covering any stars, you know, and it's dark. You, you can barely see a meter in front of you. But inside those caves, I mean, you can't see your hand a few centimeters in front of your face. It was overwhelming almost like anxiety producing. So this year we've been in incredible kind of darkness, anxiety producing for sure. It's been overwhelming at times. It's been a kind of darkness where it's impacted us in ways that we never expected. We couldn't even have imagined. And so today, LBC, we mark one year when we learned about COVID being in Kenya. I don't know about you, but I vividly remember that day where I was when I got the news and then my phone just started blowing up. And then we all started making plans, right? To rush to Carrefour to get toilet tissue and other supplies. Cause we've been hearing these crazy Americans who were <laughs> buying up all the toilet paper in the world. And we got to get to Carrefour before they do. And so it was this surreal day. And for many, it was, you know, it was initially exciting. Of course, we're concerned about this virus, but it was kind of this adventure. But then the darkness slowly starts creeping in. So it's, it's hard to believe. It feels like either yesterday or a year ago that coronavirus came to Kenya and we entered a pandemic. Well, as we get back into the Gospel of Luke this week, we continue in our series with the passion of Jesus in Luke's gospel. We see this enveloping darkness as Jesus heads toward the cross. And I think this passage helps to drive home a, a kind of darkness. And in fact, as we enter into the season, as we continue in the season of Lent, it's like an invitation to enter into a season of darkness, to really reflect on what Jesus went through. And so as Luke writes, he is inviting us into this deep place of considering what was it like for our Lord Jesus to remember what he came to do, to remember his mission. And so we're going to get into this text today, and I want to invite you to consider along with me, perhaps for yourself, you know, 2,000 two years later after Luke is writing, to think about the kind of darkness that can envelop us. And I think what I, what I want you to walk away from today is how darkness invites denial. There's a way in which in our lives, whatever kind of darkness we're going through, that it invites a denial of our Lord Jesus, who he is and what he came to do. And so it can look a number of different ways. One is that um, we are tempted to denial because of how the darkness around people, there, there's, a, there's a darkness around the disappointment we have with people, maybe rejection, or there's loneliness, or loss, or tension, or conflict. 
kind of darkness and disappointment with circumstances. So pandemic, financial struggle, the loss of a job, parenting difficulties, just struggles with time. There just doesn't feel like there's enough time in the day to do all that we need to do. Well, then the third one is that there can be disappointment with God, the darkness of disappointment with God, where we say, God, all these things I've just listed, I'm struggling because it, it doesn't seem like you're coming through for me. And so as we enter this text, I want you to be thinking through what, what, what is the particular darkness in your life right now, whether it's just the common ongoing pandemic or, or something else in your life, and invite you to journey with me as Luke invites us into this text. And I pray that as we do so, that the Holy Spirit will open up our hearts to see Jesus as he is and his response to the darkness. So we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 22, verses 40, starting with verse 47. And this is God's holy inspired word. Luke 22, 47. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion? Do you've come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow is with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This is the word of the Lord. So can anything push back the darkness? The darkness that threatens to overwhelm, to envelop us. Can anything push it back? I think as we come into this text, what helps us to see is that Jesus is not surprised by the darkness. And so the first thing I want us to see is that Jesus is not surprised by the darkness of betrayal. Where do we see that? Well, first of all, notice this darkness theme. Jesus, he identifies, he labels the darkness. So jumping ahead to the end of our first scene here, right? Because we just have two scenes. Each of, this, each of them has essentially a main point. In this first scene, at the very end, verse 53, he says, this is your hour, saying this to the religious leaders, the crowd that's come to arrest him. This is your hour when darkness reigns. Jesus is not surprised by the darkness. Of course, they're coming to him at night. And if you remember from last week, where Ben preached on Jesus praying in the garden with the three, they're there on the Mount of Olives, and Luke starts out here in verse 47, while he was still speaking. I mean, he was literally in the midst of speaking, telling them, pray that you may not fall into temptation. And these guys walk up. So darkness is enveloping the scene already as Judas, one of the 12, Luke tells us, comes up to betray him with a kiss. 
an intimate treachery. And notice there in verse 48, Jesus asks him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Now, as we've seen before in the Gospels, whenever you see that phrase, Son of Man, whenever you hear that phrase, Son of Man, put yourself in the shoes of those in the scene to think about what they would have been hearing. Steeped in the Hebrew Scriptures, when they hear that word Son of Man, the book of Daniel comes to their mind. And they would think of this. Where in this prophecy, Daniel says, Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. He came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and a glory and a kingdom. And all peoples and nations should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. See, it's that son of man who is being betrayed. They're coming to arrest him in violence. And yet look what happens. This right ear that gets cut off by one of his followers comes to symbolize so much of this scene. Because they come expecting violence and the disciples, they still don't get it, right? I mean, earlier they had said to him, uh, as they're going off to the Mount of Olives, that, hey, we have two swords. And Jesus basically says, enough of that talk. Enough of this sword talk. Let's go. Let's go pray. Well, here it's like they still, it's like they didn't hear him. They still think they need to resort to violence to defend him or to bring the kingdom or whatever it is. But what happens when violence actually happens? He reaches down, he reaches up and heals this man's ear. No more of this. Yes, he is that son of man who will have a dominion and a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And yet he's not leading a rebellion. He's not there to overturn the authorities. So why all this violence? So Jesus is not surprised by the darkness of betrayal, though his followers do not get it. The crowd does not get it. The son of man will be betrayed into the hands of men. So, like me, the likelihood is you're not going to be tempted by the darkness of betrayal of Jesus. You you won't have that same opportunity that Judas had. So you might wonder, Jeremy, is there something more relatable? And I think there is. And we see in this next section, this next scene, is the darkness of denial. And we see that Jesus is not surprised either by the darkness of denial. One of the craziest sports to me in the Olympics, in fact, one of the craziest sports ever is bobsledding. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. In fact, the the picture that I'm gonna put up on the screen is of the Jamaican bobsled team. And I love this team because as you know, there is absolutely no snow in Jamaica whatsoever. But these guys decided, see, what sport are we gonna pick for the Olympics? How about bobsledding? And so somehow these guys train somewhere in the world. And from whatever country, this sport is just insane. Because you take four human beings, you put them inside a metal tube and hurl them down this ice track at speeds approaching 200 kilometers per hour. We are a crazy race, this human race, (laughs) to come up with a sport like this. Well, what's funny about bobsledding is you start off on level ground and you make this intentional push as hard as you can. These four people push off on level ground to pick up speed and then gravity takes over, reaching speeds of 200 kilometers per hour. I think denial works a lot like that. Denial just seems to pick up speed. I don't know in your life what kind of denial you face, whether it's some kind of addiction or denial about a relationship or denial about what's happening in some way in your life. What's interesting about this text is that as the reader, you look at it and you think, this is just picking up speed. One after another, Peter just denies, denies, denies. And yet if you look closely, you see that he actually had time. It says that a little later, someone else saw him and said, you're also one of them. 
Then it was an hour after the second one when he was asked the third time. So he actually had this time to reflect, to think about the words of the Lord, even what the Lord had prophesied about this very scene. And yet he continued to deny. Well, so as the reader, you read it, and it's just one after another. The first, starting with a servant girl, one of the the lowest positions in society. And yet, even with her, he did not have the courage to say, yeah, that's me. Yeah, I'm, I'm with him. And it just seems to, to snowball, if you will, the gravity of the situation takes over and he continues to deny. But in this scene, this is what I want you to notice. In this darkness of denial, look at verse 61. It says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Notice it doesn't say that he looked at Peter with some kind of look. He looked straight at Peter. This is not a look of rejection. See, I think when we are betrayed or when people disown us, we're the ones who turn away. We're the ones who reject, but not Jesus. As I reflected, church, on this passage, I was so moved to see our Lord that even though he had prophesied this about Peter. When Peter does this, he turns and looks straight at him. What an incredible Lord. What an amazing Son of Man. If you remember from the passage Lily preached a couple weeks ago, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. But when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. So I think the question comes up, did Jesus' prayer, did it not work? Because Peter failed, his faith failed here. But it failed this time. It failed this time. In fact, we see in the book of Acts, it failed at least another time for Peter. And yet the Lord, having looked straight at him, we know the rest of the story, that Peter was restored. And he did turn back and he did strengthen his brothers. Because the Gospel of John tells us that in another meal, the disciples see Jesus on the beach. And basically what he does is he cooks them breakfast on the beach. And three times he asked Peter to to mirror, if you will, or to parallel these three denials. He asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, three times, I love you. He said, okay, then feed my sheep, feed my lambs. So Peter was restored. Think about our own lives for a bit this morning. And whatever darkness may be surrounding you, to consider what are the ways in which we are tempted to disown Jesus. That's the the word there in verse 61. In what ways are we tempted to disown him? It's synonymous with deny. And what's so powerful about this word is that in the original, it has this sense of denying who you are. That disowning involves this denial of, of who you are in this relationship that you're a part of and the person you're disowning. And so both as this intimate follower of Jesus that Peter is, he's in effect denying a part of himself as he denies, as he disowns his Lord. And if you're here this morning in this garden or you're watching on the video, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit resides in you, you and I are united to Christ, like two pieces of paper glued together. And so to to disown him, to deny him, is to deny even a very part of ourselves. I wonder, do you see Jesus as just sort of detached from you? And so maybe to deny him or to disown him is a bit easier. But if we see ourselves as united to our Lord, united to the Son of Man, do you see how in denying him or whatever it is in our lives, We disown a part of ourselves. 
So I wonder for you if maybe a temptation to disown him, to deny him, is because of the way other Christians give him a bad name. Maybe even resorting to violence, which is exactly what happens in this first scene, right? They completely don't get it. They resort to violence in the name of Jesus. So maybe it's in some ways that other Christians, they give him a bad name, and so you're tempted to deny him. Maybe in polite company, to deny Jesus. Or maybe it's because you're so drawn by your flesh and the world and ways in which you're tempted to deny Jesus. The darkness can be so powerful and it invites us to denial. One of the amazing things about when you're in those caves of Mount Suswa and the torches, the lights are all turned off and you sit there for about two minutes until the silly teenagers scream to try to scare you. But for about a minute or two of silence in absolute darkness, you realize that your other senses are incredibly heightened, are incredibly strengthened. You, you start to hear in a certain way. You, you maybe smell, and in those caves, the smell of bats and baboons is just awful. So all these other senses are heightened. Yesterday, I had a conversation with Joyce, who's part of our church, and, and many of you know Joyce. She's just been a beautiful part of our church, along with her, her family. And Joyce gave me permission to, to share a bit of her story, her testimony. So a number of years ago, Joyce essentially woke up and was faced with blindness. And partial deafness in one, one ear eventually came along. And a number of doctors looked at her and just no one could come up with why she just suddenly became blind. And so Joyce shared how in learning to live with blindness, even after going through a really difficult period, as you can imagine, of emotional darkness, she's learned to live with this literal blindness in such a way that her senses are incredibly heightened. So with touch... I mean, she can just easily identify objects to be able to maneuver around a room or just any, even a public space in her neighborhood. She said also her, her sense of, of smell. Her hearing with her one good ear is incredibly heightened. She can pick up on things that most people who can see don't hear. And then she said, describe this almost uh, sixth sense. Sixth sense. Try to say that fast ten times. Sixth sense. Almost like another sense where she can sense danger in a way that most people can't. She said she can read people in, in a pretty amazing way and she can sense danger and discomfort around her. And it was a, a joy to hear Joyce share what God has been doing in her life this year and in her family. That even with the enveloping darkness of the pandemic, the way that God has been so good to her and has provided for her and provided ways for her and her husband Buchan to, to serve during this pandemic. And one of the things I love about Joy is that, or Joyce actually, just like I said there, Joy is part of Joyce's name and you see that in her life. And so what she has experienced in having literal blindness, it just made me reflect a bit on how those of us who can see with our eyes, are there other ways in which maybe our senses need to be attuned to other things? Spiritually, what are ways in your life that you need to be more attuned to the, to the Holy Spirit, to, to things going on around you? What, what senses need to be strengthened in your life when the darkness seems to envelop you? So a couple weeks ago, Lily invited us to consider a dinner date with Jesus, following on from that story of the Lord's Supper and the impending denial of Peter, the impending betrayal of Judas. She invited us to sit across a table, as it were, with the one who says, I've, I'm one who is among you as one who serves. I want to take it a step further and just to invite you to imagine yourself sitting across that table with the one who looked straight at Peter. 
in whatever kind of denial is the, the darkness maybe feels like it's even enveloping that dinner table, that coffee date with Jesus. To imagine this one who would look straight at you, not with eyes of rejection, but with eyes of love. And I shared the story a number of months ago in my Hosea sermon. I just want to share it again because of how it fits here. But a few months ago, my family and I were at the coast on a holiday. And at this particular hotel, you know, you go to this common dining room and the, the buffet, and you see a lot of the same people. And there, over a number of meals, we happened to see this one couple who would sit together and for virtually the entire meal, every meal, the, the woman would take her phone and as she's eating, you'd be looking at her phone practically the entire time. And as I just observe this here and there, I just notice the awkwardness of the situation where the man would look at her. At times he would look away kind of awkwardly, not really knowing what to do. Sometimes he would pull out his phone and look at his phone. Occasionally they would chit chat. But imagine sitting across this table from Jesus and maybe you are distracted. Maybe you're in a period of denial in your life. Maybe you're distracted just by the darkness. But see, this Jesus, this Son of Man, this Lord, would want to look straight at you with piercing eyes. Not eyes of rejection, but eyes of love, a longing to serve you, to restore you with His grace. So my question for you today is, will you invite Him in? Will you invite Him into the space in your life? where he can look straight at you. See, this is a penetrating gaze. And many of us, because of whatever has happened in our life or whatever is happening in our life right now, it's actually really uncomfortable when someone looks at us, looks at us with a penetrating gaze of love. But you see, this Son of Man is the one who, even though he comes with all dominion and power and authority, and glory. He's the one who wants to serve you. And that look is one that will restore you no matter what has happened in your life. And if you're listening to this and you actually don't know this Jesus, maybe throughout your entire life you've denied him. You've never acknowledged him for who he is and what he's done. Would you come to him? Talk to any one of us about what it means to follow him to experience his grace where we can be restored no matter what darkness has happened in our life, no matter what darkness is here right now, he wants to restore. So if you just happen to be watching this, whether you're around LVC or not, or whoever you are, reach out to us. Email the church office, office at lavingtonvineyard.org. We would be happy to talk with you because as we continue in the season of Lent, LVC, let's press in to think more about who he is and what he has done. Just a couple months ago, we celebrated Christmas and we heard Sarah preach on that passage from Isaiah. A light shines in the darkness. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. He is that light. And John would tell us that the light has come and the darkness has not overcome it. He will overcome. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you sent your son. You sent your son who fulfilled that prophecy that he is that son of man. And thank you that because of his life, death, and resurrection, that a kingdom is coming. Lord, thank you that we already see signs of it because he has come and we see the kingdom advancing and one day it will fully come when sisters and brothers like Joyce will behold you with new eyes to behold her children. The kind of kingdom where there is perfect restoration where your grace 
reigns, where there is absolutely no darkness. And so God, as we continue in this pandemic and we face all kinds of darkness around us, the darkness of violence during this pandemic, the darkness of corruption, of confusion, of misinformation. Lord, would you drive back the darkness with your light for each one listening right now? I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now let's say the words of the grace together. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you, church.